attending tonight's Fine Arts Lecture Series event, sponsored by the Office of Orientation. I'm Shelby Dominic Green, Director of Orientation, and I appreciate your willingness to learn more about the tragedy that occurred in Greenwood on September 26, 1988, and the details that follow. The goals of tonight's presentation are to first educate you on this significant piece of Greenwood's history and how it impacted our community and nation. We must also learn from the Oakland shooting how to better protect ourselves in such violent situations. We hope to accomplish both this evening. Though we may talk about the open shooting and learn from it, the fact will always remain two young girls lost their lives as a result of this violent act. Tonight, we dedicate the learning that will come from this presentation to Shaquilla Bradley and Tequila Thomas precious children who love to learn and were taken from this earth much too soon. Our speakers tonight will each tell the story of September 26, 1988, or the details to follow with a unique perspective, each through a different lens. First, we'll hear from Mrs. Palsy Higginbotham, affectionately known in our community as Ms. Palsy. Ms. Palsy is a graduate of Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia, and later earned an early childhood certification from Lander. She was an active collegiate, joining the ranks of Greek leaders as a sister in Alpha Delta Pi sorority. Ms. Ms. Palsy is too modest to tell you, but I will tell you she was voted homecoming queen while at Valdosta. She was then and still is loved by many. She had a successful career in teaching with many years spent in Greenwood School District 50. Her passion for teaching is evident and her love for children is great. Please direct your attention to the screen. My name is Palsy Higginbotham and I taught for 25 years, um, uh, one year in Georgia when I was a newlywed, but uh, the rest over here, I taught at about five different schools. And tell us a little bit about your education background. My mother and all of her sisters and my grandmother and granddaddies were all teachers. So there was just nothing else for me to do but teach. And fortunately, I've loved it. I just love it. I miss the children still. I've been retired for a while. But um, I met my husband. We went to Valdosta State, which is Valdosta University, Georgia now. And um, my, I met my husband. And uh, But we have loved Greenwood. We've loved it. We've been here since 1970. Ms. Palsy, tell us about September 26th of 1988. Well, on the morning of September 26th, a young man got up and drove to Abbeville to his grandfather's house. And he took a gun and came back to Greenwood to the old Sky City and bought a lot of bullets for the gun. Then he drove to Oakland Elementary, which is now Rice. And he parked in the front and came right in the building and went straight to the lunchroom. And there were about a hundred small children eating in the lunchroom. So he started shooting and he shot one teacher and two children in there and the rest of his nine bullets. At that time he came down the hall and went in the girls restroom and filled his gun back up with nine more. At this point, a lot of the teachers had heard the noise, and they had got that you could step out the windows, and they had gotten their children out of the windows and ran away. But I was so busy with the children, and my door was closed, I didn't hear anything. So he walked right in my door and looked at me. I had a table with about six little girls at the front of the, uh, front of the room. I was teaching reading. 
and he, I had my back to the wall, and he looked at me and shot at my head, and I scrunched down like this, and it went right in the board behind my head. And then he turned around, and I, I yelled to my children, run, but every time a child stood up, he shot them. And there was a pot of flowers on the edge of my desk. I had moved one child's desk right close to mine, and he shot those flowers all over the place, and it missed the child's head by inches, and that was Josh. You'll hear from Josh. Um, and at some point, Miss Finkbinder had tried to stop him and followed him, and she came in my room, and he shot her in the mouth. Um, and then he looked at me again and shot, and it hit a little girl in front of me in the neck. Of course, she had blood all over. There was blood all over my room. <clears throat> at that point, I thought most of the children had left. And so I was attending to that child. I pulled her out of her chair under a table so that he wouldn't shoot her again. And I saw him leave my room. I looked out in the hall and he was going in a fourth grade room. So I came back in and I realized that there were about five children that wouldn't leave. They were hiding under their desks. So I got them out the window and um, I went back to see about this child and she was having seizures and bleeding. I knew she needed medical attention right away. So anyway, I went over to see if I could see anybody and Jamie Wilson followed me and he said, I'm not gonna hurt you now because he had already used up all of his bullets. So anyway, um, those children were safe. He shot six of my children and he killed two and he shot Miss Finkbinder there. That was his nine bullets. At that point, I was searching for somebody to help me with the child. And I was screaming, but everybody was gone out in the schoolyard. So I just went to my window and found some EMS people. And they came in and wanted a board to put her on, but we couldn't find anything. So one of the men just picked her up in his arms and took her out the window and to the hospital. At that point, I went outside and I was going to go up front to see if my children needed me up there. I went to the health room and there was a trail of blood all the way from my room to the health room. Some of my children were in there. But that one Shaquilla Bradley was on the floor and she passed away. And uh, several others were in there and they were trying to get them to the hospital. But the coroner wanted me to come in and identify the body and I did. And after that, we had funerals, we had court, we went through a lot before it was over with, but the corrections department has stayed in touch with me. So I know exactly, what, if they move him to another prison, they let me know, they call me. So I've been able to know that he's there and he's not getting out. Mrs. Hagemotham, um, Shaquilla Bradley and Tequila Thomas, would be about 38 years old now. They would. What do you remember about both of those young girls? Well, they were precious, both of them. They were such good students, I remember that. And Shaquilla was such a giving, sweet child. She'd even give her food away in the lunchroom. Um, they were just precious children. Third graders are, and those I missed those girls um, the rest of the school year. Uh, I do want to say I had a school, we had a school psychologist 
and she, I could not have done what I did without her. She came every day and got children who were upset, and I had a lot of parents to come and stay with the children. But she came every day until the school was out, and I could call her at night if I had a problem with a child, and she was wonderful, and that's a good field to go into. You mentioned that um, the Department of Corrections keeps you abreast of um, any changes as far as Jamie Wilson is concerned. Um, looking back on it, almost 38 years ago this took place. If you could say anything to Jamie Wilson today, um, would you want to say anything to him, and, and what would that be? I never understood even though he had problems, I never understood how he could do that. And, um, of course, we I was sitting close to him in court. That was hard. But um, his family was there, and they, were, they seemed to be a close-knit family. I just wonder if the answer was bullying, because they said he had been bullied his entire school school years. So that's the only thing I could come. But I'd like to find out his thoughts about why he did that. Mm -hmm. At this point, he might not be able to tell me. But. Well, and I personally want to share with you, I don't know if you realize the, the legacy you've left on local educators. I moved back to teach in Greenwood in 1999 and taught kindergarten. And when I did, I was um, my the location of my classroom was right next to a teacher who had received training under you while she was a student at Lander. And when I walked into her room and asked her about the physical layout of her classroom, she shared with me that she put the cubbies close to the door because that was something she had learned from you so that there was always a physical barrier between the door and anyone who would enter the classroom and her children. And that um, was certainly a strategy that I then immediately took up. But I'll tell you, I, before the end of the year, after that happened, after Christmas, I put felt under all of the chairs so that because the chairs would move and they would get upset. If anybody came into my room, they would get upset. So I did everything I could to make it easy and peaceful and still a learning environment. Well, you have a very important story to tell about the Greenwood community, and I can't thank you enough for your willingness to share that story with Lander students. If there's one thing you would, you would share with collegians about a campus and its safety, what what would you want students to know? Well, I think that there needs to be a lot more security. And I don't know the answer with these uh, buildings the way they're, they're laid out now. But I feel like people need to um, be identified when they come in the front door and um, wear tags. And I really have worried about that because there was a button beside the door in my classroom that I could uh, press and get in touch with the office. But I couldn't make it over there. I couldn't get to that. But surely there's something that can be done about that. And I do hope that we can work that out. Ms. Palsy, thank you so much for telling us your story. You are so welcome. of the University of South Carolina 
Mr. Sims served our country in the United States Navy with the search and rescue team. He is an engineer at Greenwood Fabricating. Mr. Sims is an active member of the Greenwood community where he resides with his wife, Meredith, and their two children. Josh Sims was a student in Ms. Pavsey's class in 1988. Please welcome Mr. Josh Sims to the stage tonight. seem that big of a deal. I kind of brush it off. Eh, whatever. I'm fine. I'm growing up. I'm sure I'm lucky that I'm here and I wasn't the one that caught a bullet. Um, yeah, that day seemed normal. Talking about Shaquille and Tequila. Shaquille was this boisterous, larger than life, little girl. I remember her teaching me how to, <laughs> we had this little Z-snap thing going on. And oh, she was just so fun. And Tequila was really quiet, really quiet. And she was sweet as can be. And I think I used to try to copy her paperwork. <laughs> homework maybe. Either way, I, in the classroom, we were in the classroom, and I guess maybe we were being loud, the, the door was closed. All the other classrooms, they heard the noise. They heard the gunshots and the, the fire from the cafeteria, and, and we didn't. We were just carrying on, doing what we were you know, there to do that day. In the classroom, if you go to Oakland Elementary or Rice Elementary now, down the hallways, the doors are recessed in just slightly, maybe two or three center blocks. And so inside the classroom, they're also recessed in. You know, there's a, a juxtaposition there. And she sat, Miss Higginbotham, at the front of the class. When you open the door, the wall went down, and there was the board. There's Miss Higginbotham, and there was like a half moon table that she was discussing there. And across the room, there were two windows, one on each side of the wall, or each end of the wall, and that was her desk. But right here in the front, right here, that's where I sat. I sat in the second row, right behind Tequila. To the left of me was Shaquilla. Behind me was a, a guy named Joey, who happened to get shot as well. I'd been bad, probably talking, probably when I wasn't supposed to. I'm sure it was innocent, but it wasn't exactly you know, good model behavior. And so, Miss Higginbotham had decided that I needed to be separate from everyone. And there was a desk. My desk stayed there, but there was a desk right beside her desk. And it wasn't the first day that I happened to be moved to that desk. <laughs> It probably wasn't the last day that I was moved to that desk either. When he walked in the door, I remember looking across the classroom and just chaos. 
chaos happened. The first thing I did once I realized, I'm sure there was a few seconds, felt like a long time. I keep thinking about this over and over again here recently. Felt like a long time. I'm sure it was maybe a second or two seconds or something. But I dove under her desk. It was more substantial than mine. And sure enough, I thought I was the only one that remembered the flower. There was a flower basket and it had plaster of Paris or cement or something. And so there were some fake flowers on it. It wasn't real flowers. And sure enough, that flower pot got shot. I hid under that desk until the, the gunshot stopped. And most of the class had, had ran out, had ran past Jamie, had ran out of, into the hallway and, and fleed. I was one of the few that stayed. I remember her gathering us up, the few that were left, and trying, fiddling with the window, a stupid window, wouldn't, wouldn't open. It wouldn't open at first. It was difficult for whatever reason. And finally she got it open, but the whole time she's fiddling with it, he is walking across the classroom. By the time the window opens, he's a us. I mean, he's right there with us. And saying he's not gonna hurt us, we jump out of the, we jump out of the window and he follows us. And I thought Miss Higginbotham went with us. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. And we ran to the, to the end of the, the building, the hall there, away from the front of the school, back towards the woods. And we made the corner, and around the corner was Miss Rice with Hugh Butler. I don't know if you know Hugh Butler, but when he was young, he probably stood this tall. <laughs> he was a big, burly man. He still is a big, burly man, sorry. And it was great to come around that, come around that wall, that corner, and to see those two, my principal and this massive cop. They were gonna, they were gonna help us. Hugh did what Hugh was supposed to do with the, you know, with the shooter. Miss Rice ushered us off to the library, inside the library in Oakland, all the way to the left, way in the back, there's a little closet. There's a little book closet or something. And we ended up piling in there, the five of us, or six of us, however many it was, with another 15 or 20 students. And we sat there forever, it seemed like. And I guess they knew we were there, and I, I guess that was a, a good thing. We were safe where we were, and cops were going throughout, making sure it was just a single shooter, and uh, you know, clearing the area and making sure everything was safe. Once it was safe, we all went out to the front yard, where we always have field day. It's, it's the only time you get to the front of the school is on field day, or in this case. And we sat out there waiting on our parents to come. The, yeah, talking to my dad the other day about this, hey, I'm gonna come up here and talk about this. I've never ever talked about it at home, but I'm gonna come talk about it to you guys. He was telling me his story from it. My dad's an insurance salesman. And he goes door to door selling insurance or collecting the insurance. And at the time, he was in a different county. And there weren't cell phones. Bag phones hadn't even been issued out then. But his, his best friend knew, just happened to know where he was. And when the, when the radio came out, you know, that it, it had happened, he... Lamar took off and, and found Dad, and uh, he kind of got broke up about it. You know, now, three days ago, about the the immense emotions that kind of overtook 
him on his drive, you know, I'm sure speeding, breaking all the traffic laws to try to get to you know, his sons because my, my brother was also, uh, I don't believe he was there. I believe he was, he, he went to Oakland, but I believe he was K-4, so he maybe left early. It was an early release. And so the days go by after the event. I remember the, the funerals. At some point, all of the, the individuals that were injured in the event got to go to Columbia. They got to go to the governor's mansion, meet the governor. The state museum had just opened, or was fairly recently opened. And they got to go to the state museum and they got a fancy lunch and everyone else had to stay back during the school day. And I, I felt so disappointed and envious of them. And I was disappointed that I, I didn't get to go. Man, I wish I, wish I had gotten hurt so I could go. Uh, you know, what, what does an eight year old think? I don't know. We made a, a, a nature trail behind Oakland. There, there was an outdoor classroom with a, a slate board, and Rudy Mankey came down to commemorate the opening of this nature trail dedicated to Shaquille and Tequila, and I, I'm, I guess all the, the injured, and I thought it was the coolest thing that Rudy Mankey was my hero uh, from ETV. A naturalist, and so he was there, and I got to meet Rudy, and that was cool. And the days turned to weeks, and the weeks into years, and I was afraid of the dark. Abnormally afraid of the dark for a long time. And eventually, you know, seeing counselors at the school, that was great. And then we went to see some counselors outside of the school. I'd like to say I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. <laughs> Haven't been for a long, long time. But it's just, it's amazing, you know, I, how, how much this has really affected my life. And I guess I haven't acknowledged it throughout the years. Speaking over the last few weeks, I've contacted several of the students that were in the class, and then talking about it, I guess in prep for this, I've talked to individuals that were around. Maybe they were in a different class, or a different grade, or they had a brother, or a sister, or an aunt was a teacher. And everyone has their story from 1988, of how it affected them, and it kind of touched the whole community. Kat Finkbeiner, what an amazing woman she is that Miss Higginbotham kind of grazed over the, uh, her, her heroism. She refused to move to get out of Jamie's way and he, you know, asked her to get out of the way and told her to get out of the way and she stood blatantly in front of him and refused to move until he put the gun to her face and you know made his way with her to do whatever he needed to do I didn't think it was going to bother me this much I'm just a random guy they just happened to be going to a school. I happened to be lucky that I wasn't the one uh, to get shot. And, you know, now I always go in a room and I look for the exits. I didn't realize that this was attributed to, to this, but maybe it is. I'm in a time in, a life, in my life where I'm reflecting on how events in my past have kind of shaped who I am. 
and I've avoided this event. So it's been nice, a healing process to kind of understand for myself. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I'm trying to answer some of the questions. I was thinking some of the questions that you asked. How is he? Uh, yeah, the, the school changed. There was a parent or another teacher or an assistant that sat at the front of the school. There was one unlocked door for the entire school. Before that day or on that day, all the doors were unlocked. You could come and go. There was no reason to have any, any defensive mechanisms put up. After that day, there were, you know, a lot of changes. Sigma Bottom talks about creating barriers and just the things you you don't you shouldn't have to do, but then in, in the face of something tragic, you end up forcing yourself. You change how you are, I guess. You accommodate the, the tragedy within you. I don't know. Um, let's see. The, the one thing that I would like to see changed or... It's, it's funny. Oakland happened. And then, you know, several years later, there were other school shootings, and then Columbine happened. I remember I was out sick when that happened. And uh, all of these events have taken place. And then uh, the event up in Massachusetts a couple of years ago, uh, where does it lead us? Are we still, I mean, this is a handgun, right? I don't, I don't want to talk about gun rights or anything, but this was a handgun, it wasn't a, a machine gun or an assault rifle. I mean, anybody can get one if you're over 21 for the most part. Uh, most stores sold the bullets in Old Sky City, right? Jamie was, uh, was definitely bullied. There's a great story if you haven't read in the Post and Courier from Charleston that a reporter went back and the reporter happened to be somewhere near the courthouse on that day in Greenwood. And then, so there's a personal connection that he has and then he went back later and you know, kind of followed up. I'm sure he, he might have talked to Judge Moore or Miss Higginbotham, but he was definitely bullied not only by his schoolmates, but by his, by his father. Um, and, you know, what makes a person <laughs> snap or decide to, you know, do something so horrific? I don't know. It just makes you really, it makes me really appreciate every day that I've, I have here, uh, especially with my two daughters. I don't, know, I don't really have anything else to say, Shelly. Justice James Moore attended public schools in Greenwood and graduated from Greenwood High School where he served as president of the student body. He received his bachelor degree from Duke University and his Juris Doctor degree from Duke University School of Law. While at Duke, he was a member of Greek Life and Phi Delta Phi Legal Fraternity. 
Following graduation, Justice Moore began working in private practice and served four terms in the South Carolina House of Representatives. In 1976, Justice Moore was elected as resident circuit cut judge, excuse me, circuit court judge of the Eighth Judicial Circuit, a position he retained until 1991. In 1991, he was elected as an associate justice on the South Carolina Supreme Court, where he remained until retirement in 2008. Justice James Moore is the judge who presided over this case, State of South Carolina, B. Wilson. Jamie Wilson, the lone gunman. I invite Justice Moore to help us further understand this event in Greenwood's history. The number of mass shootings is tragic and astonishing. And the United States experiences more than any other country. One reason, but not the only one, is the prolific operation of uh, an easy access to guns. There are over three million guns in the United States. There's no simple answer to the problem. My brief remarks tonight will relate to the legal proceeding and certain aspects of that tragic event that occurred in Greenwood in 1988 and as usual when no one expected it. Jamie Wilson, then age 19, drove to his grandmother's house in Abbeville and stole her revolver and then drove to a discount store and purchased some destructive hollow point ammunition to replace the regular ammunition that was in the fifth. He then rode by Greenwood High School and decided against stopping there and proceeded to Oakland Elementary where he began shooting in the cafeteria until his gun was empty. He then went into a restroom, reloaded the gun and began shooting in the classroom, as you have heard earlier. He was indicted for two counts of murder, nine counts of assault and battery with intent to kill, and one count of carrying a firearm. He pled guilty but mentally ill and was sentenced to death for the two murders and 175 years on the other charges. The death penalty has been debated since the beginning of America and is authorized in 37 states and the federal government. The United States is the only Western country currently applying it and one of 57 countries worldwide applying it. There were no executions between 1967 and 1977. And in 1972, the United States Supreme Court struck down capital punishment statutes in the case of Furman versus Georgia. Subsequently, a majority of states passed new death penalty statutes. And since then, more than 7,800 defendants have been sentenced to death, and more than 1,400 have been executed. 159 were exonerated, and more than 2,900 are still on death row. The death penalty is applied only for murder involving an aggravating factor or circumstance, such as multiple victims, a child under the age of seven, a robbery. The choices before 1981 for murder were guilty, not guilty, or not guilty by reason of insanity. 
South Carolina and other states follow what we call the McNaughton Rule. McNaughton was a case from England in the 15th century. And the test is called the McNaughton Rule to determine insanity. And the question is whether or not the defendant knows the difference between right and wrong. A jury usually determines the guilt and the punishment in the death penalty cases. In 1981, John Hinckley shot President Ronald Reagan, and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. When one is found not guilty by reason of insanity, he is uh, committed to a mental facility and can later be released if the medical authorities determine it is safe. John Hinckley was released just a few years ago after being confined since 1981. This event and the result led to many states, including South Carolina, adding the choice of guilty but mentally ill, which is defined under our law as lacking sufficient capacity to conform one's conduct to the requirements of the law. Jamie Wilson pled guilty but mentally ill before me and without a jury, and I had to decide to punish him. It was an unusual proceeding, the first in South Carolina and maybe the first in the United States. It was conceded and agreed that Wilson was not insane. In other words, he knew the difference between right and wrong. He planned the event, stealing the gun, buying the hollow point ammunition, which was more destructive, and avoiding stopping at the high school. Every trial is emotional, and every death penalty trial is even more so for all involved. The main question before me was, could the death penalty be applied to one guilty but mentally ill, and what was the appropriate punishment or punishment or sentence for Jamie Wilson? There were no precedents, and I had to decide what the legislature intended. After much consideration and study, I concluded that the legislature intended the possible punishments to be the same as in other cases, and that under all the circumstances that the death penalty was the appropriate sentence. The South Carolina Supreme Court later affirmed my decision, that is, that it did not violate the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. The decision was later upheld in the state and federal post-conviction relief proceedings. And there were other issues discussed in these lengthy opinions of the Supreme Court and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. But the bottom line was that the death penalty could be applied in a guilty but mentally ill verdict or plea. The present status of Jimmy Wilson is that he is still on death row. There is a proceeding, I understand, to determine his competency. In other words, whether he's competent to be executed. The efficacy of the death penalty and the rationale of causes of such heinous crimes will be the subjects of the debate for legislatures, courts, scientists, and psychiatrists for years to come. <laughs> This event at Oakland and this program here tonight show that we must always be aware, prepared, and vigilant. Thank you.
Program 02, Lambert University Police Department Officers, Lieutenant Dina Gossett and Sergeant James Burke. Both officers are graduates of the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy and have a wealth of information regarding law enforcement and specifically active shooter knowledge. Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Gossett with Lanner University Police Department. As we know, active shooter incidents are evolving daily. <coughs> no one incident is the same. Law enforcement officials are learning more and more about the logistics of the incidents every day. It used to be that active shooter training events revolved around training how law enforcement officers respond to these events. However, due to active shooter events happening more frequently, the focus has shifted from training law enforcement officers to training civilians as well. While we don't claim to know everything, Sergeant Burke and I are going to give you the tools you need to help you prepare and hopefully survive these types of incidents should one ever occur where you are. This training is not to say what was done in the past is wrong, but to gain knowledge from the past and train better for the future. So one event that helped change the way law enforcement responds to active shooter events is the Columbine Massacre in 1999. And later we'll explain why that changed the way law enforcement responded. This is the audio of a phone call from Patty Ilson, a teacher at Columbine High School the day of the shooting. Pay attention to what she says. Okay. 
you think Patty ever thought what would I do if prior to this day? The answer is probably no. Tragically, 10 of the 13 fatalities at Columbine occurred in the library. These were the kids who were hiding under the tables as they were instructed to do so by Patty. This is the acronym we are going to instill in you tonight. ADD, avoid, deny, and defend. We're gonna discuss this a little bit more in depth later. Let's take a look at some of the research into active shooter events. The data we're going to discuss today comes from the 2014 FBI report titled A Study of Active Shooter Incidents from 2000 to 2013. However, for the purpose of this presentation, it's been modified to include 2014 incidents. The federal definition of an active shooter event is one or more people actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. The shooter, they have no profile. It can be anybody. It can be the person next to you behind you, in front of you. They range in age from young to old, the, young being, they, the youngest being reported at 13, the oldest at 80. Most are male, in fact, 96% of them are male. But let's not exclude the females, it's possible. They are deliberate, they're focused, and they're detached during these events. They come from all races and all backgrounds. Some announce their intentions and broadcast it on social media. They might even have to send out clues to their friends. And another thing to keep in mind is that for a majority of the time, the shooter kill themselves when they're confronted by law enforcement officers. So we're gonna look at some data here. The yellow dots are gonna represent the active shooter incidents from 2000 to 2014 in the United States. The small dots represent zero to four people being shot, the medium dots five to nine, the larger dots 10 or more people. From 2000 to 2014, there were 179 active shooter incidents that occurred in the United States. Location of attacks. Many believe schools are the most frequently attacked locations. However, commerce locations make up the majority of, majority of the attack locations with a total of 52%. By commerce, we mean retail, shopping malls, manufacturing facilities, and offices. Schools represent 25% of the attacks. 12 to 13% occur outdoors and 10 to 11% occur at other locations such as churches, hospitals, and military bases. The sh shooter connection to the incident location. 55% of the time the shooter is connected to their location, meaning a former employee or an employee, a student or a former student. 45% of the time there is no connection to the incident site. We're gonna look at some examples, not examples, but some events that have occurred in the past. So we've already heard from our survivors here about the Oakland Elementary School shooting in 1988. I'm not gonna really spend a lot of time on this since they spoke about it. I will say that it was reported that Jamie Wilson actually stated that he pulled the trigger as he remembered the ridicule he endured from classmates at other schools for being overweight and dressing funny. Sandy Hook, 2012. Shooter was Adam Lanza, 20-year-old male. Prior to this event, he actually killed his mother. He then went to this school and there is no reported connection to him and the school. He was armed with an assault rifle, two pistols, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. He had a fascination with mass shootings. 20 children and six adults were fatally wounded. 
Virginia Tech, April 16th, 2007. We're going to go into the logistics behind the shooting later. Sergeant Burke will. 32 people killed and many others wounded. This one is unique because the shooter actually started his rampage two hours prior at a dormitory where he killed two other people. And then he went to Norris Hall where he actually chained the door shut so that people couldn't get inside. Columbine High School, 1999. Again, this is the event that changed the way law enforcement responded to active shooter events. Two suspects. I'll give you a little background on their actions that day. Both these students arrived at the school at 11.10 a.m. They walked into the cafeteria and placed two double bags containing two 20-pound propane bombs set to explode at 11.17 a.m. They went back to their cars and waited for the bombs to explode. When the bombs did not explode, they re-entered the school, heavily armed, and began their rampage. 13 killed, 23 wounded, a 47-minute rampage. This is why we changed our response as law enforcement officers. Prior to Columbine, our response was that even if one officer was on scene right as the attack was starting, we waited for backup before we entered. We waited until we could form a team of people, of law enforcement officers, to enter that building and take out the threat. Since this event, it has now changed to a one officer response. So if one officer is on scene, they gain entry to that building at that time and eliminate the threat without backup. That way we can decrease the amount of time that that shooter is wreaking havoc. So the number of deaths is a product of two things. How long it takes police to arrive and target availability. Target availability, I mean you. You guys are the victims, you guys are the targets. We train police to get to the site quickly, but we are here to train you to make you less available. The average law enforcement response time to get to these events is three minutes. In the law enforcement world, this is amazingly fast. To you guys that are experiencing an event like this, it will seem like eternity. That three minutes is when you have to fight for your life. This is your survival. So let's look specifically at response actions, or excuse me, response options we would like so that you guys as civilians to remember. First thing is don't deny it. If something feels wrong and looks wrong, it's wrong. Many times in these incidents, when we go back and we talk to victims, they report that they heard things that heard something that sounded like fireworks. I ask you this: How many times have you heard fireworks at your place of employment or your place of education? Probably not many. So this is Christina Anderson. She is a survivor from the Virginia Tech shooting. She played dead and was shot a total of three times. Once when the shooter first arrived and twice more when the shooter returned. She's gonna talk about how playing dead is not a good strategy. Let's listen to what Christina has to say. So this is pretty important. This day, I ended up sitting in exactly the same seat I always did, in the back right hand corner on the right side of the class. What we don't know is that this time someone is downstairs and he's chaining all three doors shut. There's supposed to be desks there, all you guys can see. We heard the first gunshots outside in the hallway and my teacher, she opened the door 
She immediately slammed it and she said, call 911. And the second that door closed, he walks in. He walks in shooting. There's absolutely no time. He goes to the other side of the classroom by the windows. He's holding two guns. He doesn't say anything. He just starts going down the rows of people. It's very quick. It's very loud. It's very scary. We had these very shitty desks. I get on the floor. I put my knees under the chair, my stomach on the seat, hands overhead, eyes are closed. As the shots keep going, and it's, like I said, very loud, I can tell it's getting closer and closer. And I'm telling myself, brace yourself, your turn is going to come. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Like, I didn't think I was going to get shot. But I knew that something really serious was going on. And I knew, for whatever reason, that I should just play dead. He shoots me. The first time's in the back. And you'd be surprised. Getting shot doesn't hurt that much because shock overtakes you. But it starts to like burn and really kind of seep in. And that's when it gets really uncomfortable. Um, it's not pleasant. He leaves the first time. He goes across the hall. And while he's gone, cell phones are ringing. People are coughing. And the smell of gunpowder has like completely filled the room. Gunpowder is like this really sticky, pungent, warm smell. And it just makes you very, very thirsty. He comes back. Now, this time, the shooting is more intermittent. It's slower because he's looking to see who's alive. I remember telling myself to stop breathing because I can feel my stomach hitting that chair, and I'm saying, stop, like, he can see that you're alive. The third and final time, he killed himself in front of our classroom. When the police broke in, the first thing the guy said was, we have a lot of blacks in here. I didn't know what that meant, but when police sweep a crime scene, they have 30 seconds. If you're red, you're critically injured. If you're yellow, you'll live. Black means you're dead. In nine minutes, he killed 11 of my classmates and my teacher. 32 people lost their lives that day. So while we're talking about playing dead, let's talk about hiding and hurt. Hiding is problematic. There are two issues. The first is that whatever you're hiding behind probably isn't bulletproof. There just isn't much in American construction that is bulletproof. So if you're seen, you will be shot. The second related issue is that if you're seen, what do you do? In most cases, there is no way out. If you're hiding under a desk and the shooter comes around and spots you, you're dead. Hiding is called hide and hope. Hiding and hoping are not effective survival strategies. So this is our basic strategy. In order of preference, Sergeant Burke is going to take over and go in more detail with these. All right, I hope everybody's enjoying everything so far. Now we're going to get into the basic strategy of what we want to do if an incident does occur. Our first strategy, our strategy is avoid, deny, defend. Pretty simple on what you're going to want to do. We're going to break each one of these down and go in a little more depth. Under report, situational awareness. I know Mr. Sims was talking earlier. Now he says every time he goes in somewhere, he looks where the exits are. That's basically what we're talking about. Be aware of your surroundings. Know what's going on. Um, know where your exits are. If something doesn't feel right, leave. Also under avoid, like I said, leave ASAP. Know your exits. Call 911. Uh, Christina Anderson, in that video we just watched, she said the teacher went outside, saw the shooter, immediately came in, closed the door, and told everybody to call 911. How important is it really to call 911 at this particular moment? There's a guy outside actively shooting and killing somebody. What's more important? Let's try to lock this door, barricade this door, lock it so he cannot get into us, so we will be targets then. Also under a void, uh, we want to consider secondary exits. You can't just limit yourself to doors. Um, some situations, as we see in this picture, people are climbing out the window. I know they talked earlier about jumping out of the windows to get away from the shooter. Also, sometimes in classrooms and stuff, the drywall can even be broken through. And you can break through the drywall, get into another room. This might help you get to another exit. Deny. Lock the door, lights out, and stay out of sight. It's very important. 
Any classroom you go into, I hope everyone knows how to lock the door. It's been proven that just a simple lock door can keep a shooter from being able to get to you and kill you. It's that simple. Lock the door. It can't be stressed enough. Also, we're going to go in now to barricades, um, desks, tables, chairs, anything you can do, put in front of that door to barricade so that shooter cannot get into you. Also, door stops. Door stops are very effective on inward opening doors. You can stick them under the door. There's no way that door is going to be open. <coughs> As far as how we're opening doors go, we're talking about ropes, um, tactical clinches and stuff. Something very simple that most of you probably have on today is a belt. Take your belt off, wrap it around that door handle, hold it tight, and it'll be extremely difficult for a shooter to open that door to be able to get into you. Like we said earlier, three minutes is average response time. You just got to buy yourself three minutes for law enforcement to get there. Three minutes. Now we're going to defend. So at this point, we've realized we can't, maybe we can't get out. We're in this room, we've got the door locked, we're barricaded in, so it's gonna take that shooter a little while to get to us. So now what we need to be thinking about is when he comes in that door, what are we gonna do? So you're positioning. You don't wanna stand across the room from the door where you know the shooter's gonna come in. Line up against the wall, right beside the door, so as soon as that shooter comes in, you're ready to fight and fight for your life. Most of the time, a shooter's gonna come in like this with the gun out. That gives you a perfect opportunity. Grab that gun, fight. This is not gonna be a fair fight. Use anything you have. If you have a knife, pocket knife, whatever you have, it's not a fair fight. Gouge his eyes out, do whatever you have to do. This is Lieutenant Brian Murphy. Um, he was a lieutenant in Wisconsin. He was shot 15 times and lived to continue fighting. This is all about mindset. The mindset you have to have if you're ever in a situation like this to keep fighting. He says, I'm not going out in a parking lot. I'm not going out like this. I'm not going to let my wife down. I'm not going to let my daughter down. And I'm not letting my stepkids down. Like I said, he was shot 15 times and still lived to continue fighting so he could go home and be with his family. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the Virginia Tech shoot. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. It's not, not hadn't been too long since this happened. Uh, this is the building the shooter went in. He actually chained those wooden doors shut to make it, long, make it so it took law enforcement longer to get to him. Um, the shooter shot two people earlier that morning across campus. Um, the police chief actually called in a lot more help, other officers to be on campus to help investigate those prior murders. So the shooter first, he goes into room 206. He, he starts shooting. Um, he then later left and returned back to 206 again and started shooting at more people. In room 211, the teacher heard the shots. This is where Christina Anderson was. She heard the shots, went outside, saw the shooter, came back in the room, told the students to call 911. The students attempted to barricade the door with a desk, but the shooter was able to push through. Once he pushed through, he walked down the aisle shooting the students and the teacher. He then went to room 207. The shooter walked in, shot several students and a teacher. He would then walk down the aisle. The shooter then left and attempted to return later to this room again to shoot more people. When he did, the students were able to use their bodies to barricade the door to keep the shooter from being able to get in. The shooter was able to open the door one inch, and he fired several shots into the doorknob area, but it did not hit anybody. Room 204. Uh, this professor, he held the door shut and told all the students to jump out the window. The shooter was able to shoot through the door, and he did shoot and kill the professor. Ten students made it out of the door, out of the window. Excuse me. Um, six of the people that didn't get out, of four, the four of those six died. And in room 205, the students heard the shot, and they used their feet to keep the door barricaded, so the shooter was not able to get in. 
This is a diagram that breaks down room by room. As you can see, the first two rooms, there was a lot of casualties. The shooter went into those rooms two times and was able to keep shooting people. The other rooms, they were able to barricade him at least from coming back the second time. And in room 205, they barricaded him and he was never able to make it in. Clearly playing dead and not doing anything is not a good strategy. You are not helpless and what you do matters. Um, now we're going to show you a flow chart. Some people, it makes it a little, a little easier to understand the avoid, deny, defend concept. First, the attack starts. So then you're just thinking, where are my primary exits? Okay, there's a door right here. If I can get to that door, yes, I immediately go to it and get out and avoid the situation. So no, I can't get to a door. So now I want to deny. I want to start barricading that door making it as difficult as possible for a shooter to get to me. <laughs> now we'll think about other exits. Is there a window in here? If, obviously, if I'm on the 10th floor of a building, I'm probably not going to jump out the window. Probably not a good idea. But if, there's, if you're on the bottom floor, can I get out the window? If so, I'll also go back to it, avoid, and get out. And if not, get ready to defend yourself and fight for your life. When the police arrived, um, I think earlier they told us how chaotic it was, the situation. When the police get there, it's going to be very chaotic. What you need to remember is do what, they, do what you're told. Listen to their commands. If you get handcuffed, it'll all get sorted out later, I promise you. Police will be in all different kinds of uniforms. They'll be carrying all different kinds of weapons, assault rifles, shotguns. You can see things you've never seen before. Just try to stay calm and go with it. Do, it. do what you're told. The police officer's priority at work when they arrive on scene, first priority is stop the killing. They're going to go past you and they're going to go to the shooter and they're going to try to eliminate that threat. Once the shooter is down and the threat has been neutralized, they will go on to stop the dying, which is where they will come in and they will try to help any wounded. After that, they will evacuate and secure the area. Um, EMS will obviously be responding to the scene. One thing to remember about EMS is that they will not go into the scene until it is secure, until it is cleared by law enforcement. So this could take hours. There's no telling how long this could take. If we get a big building, it's going to take forever to get it secure for EMS to come in. Um, there are a lot of people who offer first aid training, even in Greenwood, who will teach you how to help yourself if something were to happen, or help your friend, help your family. And as we heard earlier, um, the personal issues you're going to have to expect, as we heard them talking earlier, uh, I think Josh, he was, this has been 28 years ago, and he still thinks about it. He, he didn't even realize how much it affects him. Um, if something were to ever happen here at Lander, we do have counselors, and we will be able to help you. Um, you're going to have to expect some kind of PS, PTSD, survivor's guilt, shock. But like I said, here at Lander, we do have counselors, and we'll be able to help work through this. So remember, avoid, deny, defend, ADD. It's the most important thing that we're trying to get you to remember. Lieutenant Gossett and I, it's a pretty big crowd. Um, hard to take questions like this, but Lieutenant Gossett and I will stick around for a little while. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. I want to thank all of our speakers for their willingness to speak to the Lander community. Thank you very much. All of you. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, let us forever be mindful of the lives lost on September 26, 1988. Let us be prepared to protect ourselves 
and let us be kind to those who are outcast and bullied.